Yeah, well, let's get into the racing uh, and not dwell too much. Is there anything, Andy, that you kind of saw from yesterday that, that is going to inform the way you approach the rest of the week? Not as such, no. Um, I mean, there wasn't any track bias, was there? No. For once, there wasn't like a glaring like advantage to be up the stand row, which some years it can can pan out to be like that. The fact that an 80 to one shot managed to win over on the far side in the Coventry and there was a general spread with most of the straight track races suggested Chris Dickles had got it pretty much bang on. Um, and I think that's what you get when you get good to firm ground. I think sometimes when it's watered in, there's a bit of rain around, you can get a, a kinky, the rain, you know, that there is a bit of a funky, funky ground one way or the other. Um, but it just all boils down to pace, doesn't it? If you're in the right side that's got an advantage with the pace early, or early on, I think that's, that's usually uh, going to be the determining factor rather than the draw, I think, by the looks of it. Right, well, let's get cracking. Uh, Saturday's card uh, starts, of course, with the Chesham, where Bedtime Story is the 3-1 to one favourite ahead of Age of Gold at 5-1. to one. These are the best prices on the odd checker grids. A uh, girl like you, 9-1. to one. Uh, El Bernan is 10-1. to one. Uh, Pentel Bay is wildly different prices uh, across firms. You've got 12 to one in some places, 11 to two in others. Uh, local lad, 12 to one, seaplane, 16, expensive road, 16, exactly 16, 20 to one barbos. We are recording this at about quarter past 10 on Wednesday morning. Final decks uh, will be out for Saturday tomorrow. So this is kind of 24 hours or so before final decks. Um, so if you do have a bet before you know, Thursday, late morning, early afternoon, uh, then antipost rules to apply and your bet will be void. I suppose bet will be a loser and not void uh, if if it doesn't run. Uh, Andy, how do you see the Chesham? Um, well, the, the the big sort of like news story coming out of the Chesham year in year out is that it either goes the way of Aidan O'Brien or um, Charlie Appleby stroke Godolphin. I think they farmed this race in the last ten years. I think Aidan's won it five or six, and Godolphin have won it um, two or three at least. I think Pinatubo was one of the most ones obvious ones I can remember. Um, we had a bit of a skinner last year when St. Ellen won it, so it can be won from a, an outside yard, so it's not totally in tablets of stone that it'll go to the two main players. But they have got the first and second in the betting. Like the way Bedtime Story won at Leopard Town, she was very, very powerful in the latter stages, proving that she stays really well. I think that's very important. She's got a pedigree that suggests stamina is very much a, a key component. I think the, I think the a dosage index over something something like eight or nine is, is quite important when you're looking at the size as well for this race. I think that's quite a, an important angle in here and she fits that criteria. I presume Ryan Moore will ride. Um, but, um, you know, she has got a couple of strong opponents as far as I could see regards the Colts and that's Age of Gold who won well at Yarmouth. Again, another horse that hit the line really strongly. Seemed to know what he was doing, looked very professional. His time figure was pretty good. Not wildly impressive numbers-wise, but a real solid number. Uh, I just like him. I think 5 to one's a big prize for him again. I think if you're looking for a, an each-way sort of maggot bet now, he, he'd definitely fall into that category. And the other one to mention is Pendle Bay. I don't think he's running a, a stronger race as the other two, but I just love the way he won at Leicester. Um, he came from a long, long way back that day. To defy a track bias, he needed to be drawn low, and he was drawn double figures. He had to quicken up to get to the front runners over on the far side. Not only that, he went past, past them in a heartbeat. Um, and I thought, God, that that that's a good horse to be able to do that. Mm. Uh, Team Valley Racing have gone to four hundred grand to buy him off his previous owners. I think that's money well spent, and I, I, I can see he's odds around about twelve to one halving come Saturday. So it looks. To all intents and purposes, between those three, um, at the prices, I'd be more than keen on going Age of Gold and Pentel Bay because I think they'll give uh, the favourite at least um, plenty to think about anyway. Yeah, Age of Gold, 5-1 to one best price. And as I say, Pentel Bay, 12-1 to one now, but you know, there's already 11-2 to two out there. So I suggest that that 12-1 to one probably won't last too long. No. Um, Jamie? Um yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit difficult, this one, from a, a whirlpool punting point of view, because the reality is that both Bedtime Story and Age of Gold will probably be over bet in the pool, being the Coolmore and Godolphin number one choices, respectively. <laughs> and, you know, the record of those connections in this race speaks for itself, which makes it a bit of a quandary. There are lots of other races where I'm very happy to take on the, um, the, the Coolmore or Godolphin hot pot at the front of the market. But this is a bit of a challenge. Fortunately, Pencil Bay, I, I really liked on debut at Leicester. That's interesting what Andy said about the draw bias there. Um, 
I hadn't been aware of that. So that just stre- strengthens the run even more. I was just impressed by all the work he did late on. I thought the extra furlong would would suit him down to the ground here. So he was interesting for me. And also of those three would be the one that, that will overpay in, in the whirlpool or should do at least. Um, although Tom Marquand is sort of a bit of a market neutral, depends who he's riding for. Um, George Bowie tends to be under bet. And Pentel Bay, especially with those those other two big connections taking up the majority of the market, might be overlooked. But realistically, if you fancy anything else in this race, Whirlpool is going to pay big for it, um, especially in the exotics, because like I say, those two are going to be heavily bet. But for me, it'll be a small play on Pentel Bay um, and save a bit of powder for later in the day. Good stuff. Pencil Bay, yeah, 12 to 1, getting a positive mention from both of the guys. <clears throat> On to the Hardwick now, where Continuous is the 9 to 4 favourite head of Middle Earth at 3 to 1. Tower of London, Desert Hero, both 10 to 1. Mr. Cut, uh, 12 to 1. Isle of Jura, 14 to 1. Point Lonsdale, uh, 16 to 1. Candleford, 25 to 1. Hamish, 25 to 1. 33 to 1. Bar. Uh, Jamie, we'll stick with you. Um, yeah, it's, to be honest, it's a similar enough makeup here with, with Continuous mm. going to be. Um, going to be hogging a lot of the market and i don't really mind taking him on though as much as he's clear on ratings and and has the beating of the likes of desert hero and the ledger last year um desert hero is a, is a winner over uh course and not quite distance oh no so course and distance he, he mm-hmm. won the king draws uh the fifth king edward the fifth i always forget what the name of that thing the more than four handicap anyway yeah. um, um of off uh off a mark of 95 last year um and, uh, you know, I think you can put a bit of a line through his run last time out. The form of that isn't really worth much. In Middle Earth, it's very much been backed as if that form is worth a lot. Kem Han was third, didn't do a lot to to support that form line on Tuesday when he ran um, and, and was sort of at the back of the telly. So does it here, I'm inclined to give him another chance at 10 to 1 versus 3 to 1 Middle Earth. Um, and I'll probably play him in swingers with Miss the Cut. Another one who won a handicap here at the Royal Meeting, won the Golden Gates in, in 2022. That was off mark of 95, I think, as well. Or maybe one of them was off 94, one of them was off 95. <laughs> Either way, both of them won off marks in the mid-90s and have proven themselves to be much better than that since. Um, Mr. Cut then moved to the States and has since run in, uh, in, in being in very good form, twice second in Group 2s and, and twice winning Group 3s over there. <laughs> Um, so he comes here absolutely bouncing. We'll love the rattling ground. Um, obviously, we're still a bit unsure about the forecast, but everything looks set at the moment. So you'd think it would still be pretty good ground by the time this race rolls around. And I just thought those two, with, with albeit handicap experience at, at the course, um, I thought they would have the experience and know-how and maybe the, the still the scope upwards to continue to progress into group horses. So... Desert Hero and Miss the Cup would both probably be overlooked a bit by the market with Desert Hero. You know, he overpaid last year at, at um, 25s versus 19 on um, uh, SP. So, yeah, Desert Hero and Miss the Cup, my two against the field in Hardwick. Good stuff. Yeah, 10 to 1 Desert Hero, 12 to 1 Miss the Cup, the two for Jamie. Andy, how do you see it? Yeah, I think the market's way too um, uh, lopsided here. I, I, I... I don't mind continuous and I certainly don't mind Middle Earth. Nice horses, both of them. Love the way Middle Earth won at Newbury. Take Jamie's point about the form, but um, he came from a long way back to win that day. I like his tenacity, always have done. And he's got a bit of track form as well. I thought he did well to win here last year when he beat Chess Piece in a good time figure. That time figure actually puts him top on our numbers. Um, so I'm very respectful for Middle Earth, but sort of five to two, three to one at, the pe- at this very moment in time. I think you'll get at least that, if not bigger on the day, both of them. Uh, I don't think there's any great juice or um, any reason to be tipping them now at those prices. We've mm-hmm. got to be looking for something I think the listeners are going to be, be getting good value about. And I think Mr. Cut is definitely one of them. Jamie's already highlighted his claims. It was a horse that um, posted a massive time figure when he won at Lingfield on the all weather. Um, a couple of years, it might have been a year or a couple of years ago, and he, he never really went so on from that in in a, in a short period of time. But since he's been in America, he's looked really good. Um, he chased down one of Godolphin's stars over there last time out in a good, good grade two, um, and I thought that was a decent effort. Watch the video back on that uh, this morning, and he's got a bit of track form as James already pointed out. So I think he's a player, and I'd be fascinated to see if I know Brian runs Point Point, point Lonsdale here. Um, I really fancied Al Sakib on day one. I thought he ran with a huge amount of credit. 
still got utmost faith in him for as an e-ball horse because I think he wants further than a mile and a half, um, or even a you know even a mile six at Ascot. I don't think that really suited him. Just wants a, a big galloping track. Um, but Point Lonsdale beat him pointless at Chester, and the time figure was very good. But I don't know whether he's going to run or not. But if he was to, I mean, he can't be, he can't possibly be a sixteen to one shot. Um, so I'll be looking at Mr. Cut and Point Lonsdale, and I'll just mention. Isle of Jury as well. I'd be remiss not to maybe George Scott. Uh, obviously, I do um, all George, George Scott's form. Um, so it, it'd be churlish of me not to at least mention him and give him some sort of uh, uh, leg up here. Uh, this has been the target for a long, long time, ever since he, he won out in the Middle East um, throughout the winter. He had a nice little prep the other day at Goodwood, which came, he came through with flying colours. Mile and a half on fast ground, strong gallop is what Isle of Dura needs. And he's been pleasing George ever since. So he's another one to sort of consider anyway, if you're looking at taking on the front two in the market. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, Isle of Dura, 14 to 1 to, to uh, have a consideration. But both of you guys definitely agreeing there that <clears throat> too much respect being given to those at the top end. And maybe now's the time to play, albeit with the risk of you know possibly uh, the race cutting up a little bit. Uh, on to the uh, QE2. Uh, where Millstream is the five to one favourite ahead of Ken Ross at eleven to two, Shartash seven to one, uh, Mitt Bahi is eight to one, should have been a ring twelve to one, The Wizard of I twelve to one, Believing um, being well backed, it's now twelve to one, uh, Art Power fourteen to one, uh, Washington Heights fourteen to one as well. Um, for those who listened to, to previous shows, uh, Jamie, you gave a bit of an Easter egg in one of them, uh, mentioning that the uh, Wizard of I. Um, is going to be jocked up by by Ryan Moore, and that's sixteen to one is is long gone uh, now twelve to one, uh, and as short as uh, yeah nine to one in places too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, funny if I, <laughs> I probably don't quite fancy him, but it just was, <laughs> um, a sort of a bit one of those sort of pieces of information. Value is value. Yeah, exactly, which just catches your eye, um, and in a weak enough race, which which this is, I mean. Uh, last year was, I would say, a better renewal, and it was won by eighty to one to eighty to one shot Cardem. So um, yeah. I wouldn't put anyone <laughs> off anything in this. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm willing to take a chance on on Art Power. Um, he won. He, the reality is, he probably needs a bit more cut in the ground, and he also needs it to be the current. But um, <laughs> given that this is Ascot and good to firm, I can see why he's a price he is. However, you know, he did beat. Kinross here last year um, in the um, in the champion sprint at the end of the season, and he probably has a bit more tactical speed than Kinross as well, who is probably going to be tapped for toe here. I'd say over on this ground over six, he's a seven furlong specialist. He can win over six, but he probably needs them to go a little bit slower than they will do here. Um, and I can just see I don't know art power is so mercurial. Like you don't know which art power you're going to get, but if you get a good form. Art power, then 14 to 1 will look very, very big. Um, and then the other one I'm going to take, a, and this is a proper swing in the dark here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is head examined territory, but Jumbi for Eve Johnson Horton, right? Form this season reads nine duck egg, duck egg. Um, but I think the key to him is good to firm ground. And he won, uh, he won the Hungerford, he won, um, what else? He win the John Gaunt last year. You know, he's a proper Group Two, Group Three horse. Is he a Group One horse? Probably not. Um, certainly not in what we've seen in the past year. But you know, you go back to <clears throat> a couple of years ago, and he was third in the Wokingham off 105, and that is a mighty run. The Wokingham, we all know mm. how competitive that is. But on good firm ground to come third in the Wokingham off 105, you've got to be bang there. And admittedly, that's him of two years ago. You know, he's now a six-year-old. Is he in that same form? I don't know. But he's 66 to 1, and it's cheap to be wrong at that price. And if he does come back to himself, he's got every bit of form claim as anything at the top of the market. <coughs> and, um, you know, there was an 80 to 1 winner last year. Why can't there be another one this year? Um, I'll take Too right. On Jumbi. 66 to 1, currently best price for Jumbi. Uh, but as you say, probably going to be bigger uh, come the day, you would imagine. Um, and, and sound reasoning, I would say, behind it. Art power 14 to 1. Um, Andy? Yeah, I think I think the the Aussie mayor yesterday winning the the the, the King Charles epitomised the sort of standard of the level of horse we've got in this division um, currently. 
I, I just don't think they're very good, the UK and Irish are sprinters. So this race is very much up for grabs. Um, I've got no idea what's going to win it at this stage. I mean, if you go through it, like process of elimination, you, you can poke a hole in, in literally every single horse. Art Power is definitely a better horse with cutting the ground. Jumbi, uh, you know, Jamie's made a good case for that, so I'm not going to pull cold water on that. Cardon comes from a yard that hasn't had a winner for over two months. Kinross ran poorly in this race last year and is better in the autumn. Millstream's never run at the track. Mitt Bai comes from a yard that can't buy a winner. Montesib wants soft ground. Quinault's not good enough. Shartash has never run at the track. Should have been a ring ran badly in the Commonwealth Cup. Spycatcher needs soft ground. Wizard of Eye, Charlie Fellows can't buy a winner. Not sure whether Washington Heights wants a stiff six. <laughs> Believing's a five furlong horse. Swing along, um, finished third in last year's Commonwealth. You can half make a case out for her. And Vadreen wants soft ground. I, I, I just can't, I literally cannot make a cogent case out for anything. Um, <laughs> I'm process of elimination because... He's got fewer convictions and he hasn't proven himself at Ascot. Um, and I'm hoping that he does. Shartash is the one I'd probably go with because he stays seven furlongs incredibly well, but he's got really good tactical speed for six as well. I think you need a six stroke seven furlong horse to win these really good races like you do the Wokingham. So I don't think it's any negative that he's won over seven um, uh, twice this season. He's got some really good form over six from last season, but he's massively improved since he's gone to Archie Watson. Uh, and Archie Watson's horses are always, always worth considering in any race at that Royal Ascot. He just seems to get them up for this meeting more than anything else. I mean, he had a horse that nearly won the um, the Coventry yesterday, about a 50 to mm. 1. So that tells you where we are with, with Archie Watson. But he comes here in the form of his life. His time figures have been sensational. He's got a great attitude. And I'm prepared to go with him because I've got negatives for virtually everything else in the field we've <laughs> outlined. And he's the only one that hasn't... The, the only negative with him is the track. But who's to, who's to say he could easily love Ascot? Oh, well, I mean, I've never seen it. By the process of elimination, I think here, um, it is Shartash who gets the nod for Andy. Seven to one uh, best price for Shartash. Uh, on to the Jersey Stakes, the fourth race on the card. River Tiber is the five to two favourite ahead of Hartem at seven to two. Uh, even Shaddad, uh, 12 to 1, Romantic Style, 12 to 1, Never So Brave, and Advade, and Night Raider, uh, Task Force, all 14 to 1, 16 to 1, bar those. It's a, it's another race with a, a very similar shape to Andy, with a kind of a match at the top, and then uh, double figure prices the rest. Yeah, I mean, unlike the last race, which you, you know, you're sort of run, put, <coughs> you're going around in circles trying to make a case out for them. I think this is fairly straightforward, and if Jamie agrees, but. Uh, you know, it, it's just basically smacking in between the eyes that this is between Hartem and River Tiber. Um, and unless I'm looking at a different race to everyone else, then I, I'm pretty sure that River Tiber will turn the form around with Hartem. Um, I mean, it's hard to say he was not like cherry ripe for, for, for the cover because, you know, it's 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 an Irish 2000 guineas on home soil and he, you wouldn't have thought that Aiden would have had him that much undercooked. But look, you know, we look what happened to City of Troy. They thought it, they got him absolutely bang on. And, you know, he looked a totally different model the next day at Epsom. The same with uh, Rosalion. Uh, you know, connections of him were absolutely adamant that he was right for the Guineas, but he just wasn't quite there. Um, mm. You know, it's early on in the season and you, you can't, you can't um, underestimate what, what a, a run under the belt does for them, particularly in a top-class race. And River Tiber... Uh, he, I mean, he's such a massive eye catcher that day. Yes, he got beat by Rosalion on the day, fair and square, but he was definitely gunning down hard. Um, and he got squeezed for room as well in the latter stages. I, I, I think he was probably the second best horse on the day. Hartem got ridden forward. He was, he had the run under his belt, two runs under his belt, so he was rock hard. Fit. He's not going to improve anymore, Hartem. Hartem is what he is. Top class horse. You know, he, he's better than this level. But so is River Tiber. And River Tiber has also got that important victory under his belt here at Ascot when winning the Coventry Stakes. So now he's had a run. I think he'll turn the form around with Hart M. And I think 5-2 to two is an absolute gift. Absolute gift. River Tiber 5-2 to two, as short as 7-4 to four in other places. Uh, Jamie, do you agree? Uh, I definitely agree that it's between the front two and the market. I, I mean, I I wouldn't have a clear view as to 
which one of them I prefer. Unfortunately, you know, playing with a tote, you can just do the exotics where you don't need to necessarily have <laughs> the preference. Um, the one that I'm keen to throw in as well as one I just want to give another chance to is Night Raider. Um, I mean, when I say throw in, I mean, I'm probably talking about having River Tiber and Hartem permed up as a first and second in, in a trifecta and then maybe putting Night Raider in the third spot. Um, he just didn't handle Newmarket last time out. And you go back to, to his his two or weather runs at Southall. Admittedly, we aren't talking about Southall. We're not talking about, um, you know, he, he hasn't been winning races at Ascot and Newbury and Newmarket. But um, he was so he showed so much promise. And I think the drop back to seven from the mile will suit him better. He looked like a speed horse that day. Um, and, yeah, I'm just willing to give him another chance. Carl Burke's horses uh, go off bigger in, in Whirlpool 88% of the time. In this particular race, the makeup will suit uh, the the makeup of the betting will suit him to be a big overpay. And if he can sneak in into the three, he should pay pretty handsomely, especially with that recent duck egg in the guineas skewing the Hong Kong money away from him. Um, I'm just willing to give him another shot. But I, I totally agree with Andy that River Tiber and Hartem look look well clear of these, and that that would only have been uh, backed up by the by the St James's Palace with Rosalian doing what he did. So yeah, though. Pretty much the same view with a, a small soft spot for Night Raider thrown in there as well. Night Raider fourteen to one, pretty much across the board. Uh, if you do want to take the bigger prices, but otherwise, uh, it looks like a bit of a match there in the jersey. Uh, onto the Wokingham, uh, where Dark Troop is the twelve to one joint favourite with uh, Al Bashir, uh, James's Delight fourteen to one, Fresh fourteen to one, Arazio sixteen to one, Saint Lawrence sixteen to one, Apollo one sixteen to one, twenty to one. Bar those, um, I mean, as open as you'd expect this, Jamie. With 12 to 1 joint fabs um how do you see it absolutely and also crucially from a betting point of view you've got holly doyle on the favor at albashir which is brilliant mm. from a whirlpool point of view because she will be punted heavily she whatever she rides is heavily bet and <laughs> and normally the favorites are heavily bet as well so this hopefully should make the market for everything else um if you if you do like albashir that you i recommend probably punting it with the bookies um, you know, get loads of extra places, do it that way. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get SP with the tote, but ultimately you, you can get SP plus a load of places with the bookies. So I recommend doing that. Um, and in, for me, I finally get my my long standing wish here and I, I finally get to see darkness over six furlongs. Um, he's 66 to one and for a reason, because, you know, he looks to be a very difficult horse to win with, but he's been running over seven furlongs all season. And every time he leads, shows a load of pace, and then gets outstayed to the line. And he's now down to a mark of 84 from a high of 95. I really hope that this has been a, a mirror being a mirror and planning it out, plotting it out, and down to six, uh, especially a strongly run six, should see him perfectly suited. And I'm really excited about that. I, I hope that this is the plan. I hope that he's been smart and um, tactical about it all year, and, and we'll see a different darkness here. Um, I suspect he'd be quite a popular winner. I know a few a few friends um, who absolutely follow him over the edge of a cliff, and uh, that's been a very expensive cliff of late. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot here will obviously depend on the draw, and by then we'll have a very clear idea of what draw biases are doing, um, and we can see where the pace is. But um, I think I'll probably be backing Darkness re regardless, just because I'm so glad to finally see him running, running over six. He's never run over six in his entire career, um, and I wonder whether it might just be the making of him. Um, and and then sorry, and then just my other one against the field would be Torre Vega for Sheila Lavery. He was third last time in a competitive handicap at the Curra. For that was the first time in a handicap over six. Uh, it was eye catching third that day. Um, only a four year old. There's still more to come. Um, I can see Torre Vega running a massive race for for Sheila Lavery, who again will be under bet in the whirlpool. Darkness is uh six six to one Toro Vega fifty to one so two big price fancies there uh in the Wokingham for Jamie. Uh, Andy, can you give us a couple as well? I can, yeah, I can. Um I don't think he's spectacularly well handicapped as such, uh, but I do think Dark Trooper um is the you know the, the archetypal group also in a handicap here. Um there's probably one or two others in there as well. So I don't want to let, let, lead you up the garden path by suggesting he's a standout on his own. Um, but he's, he was a massive improver last season, wasn't he, with, with Ed Walker? And he won a couple of races here. The, the first one he won, he beat Washington Heights and, and Quinault. Uh, I think Russell Gold was second. 
and he absolutely battered them that day. Obviously, he was very well handicapped at the time. I think he was rated something like 89 or something like that, 90, around about that mark. So he was entitled to win in, in retrospect. Um, but, I mean, Quinault's now rated 104, I think, and, and Washington Eyes 111. So he, he gets in there for 102, and, and I think his graph is still going forward. Um, he ran in a group three beyond Anaf, didn't run too badly, didn't get the clearest to run through that day. And they subsequently took him out to Doha. Now, I don't know, really know the strength of those races, but he ran OK. He was a bit on the periphery. But then um, he went to St. Claude the other day and he literally couldn't win from where he was. I think it was a 16, 17 strong field. And he came from last to first in the, in the space of about two furlongs. It's <laughs> unbelievable viewing. If you've got a minute, you've got to go and look on the ATR website and, and see that performance. It was quite astonishing. Again, I hold my hands up. I don't know what he beat in the context of this race. But you'd imagine that, you know, 17, 18 strong handicap field at St. Clair is, is, is a pretty deep race. Um, he comes in here, obviously, with this race in mind. It's, it's got to be, hasn't it, really? I mean, what I'm, I'm racing have bought him. Um, Doyle has been booked. They know he's a course and distance winner. Um, he's going to have his conditions. I think 12 to 1 is a big price for him. I could see him being sort of half those odd, 6, 7 to 1 favourite on the day. And the other mentioned is Ferris. Now, Jack Shannon, early on in the season, I do know this for certain, he was toying with the idea of running this horse or campaigning him for the for the uh, the group race um, previously on the card, the uh, the Queen Elizabeth. I think that was a little bit pie in the sky. Uh, and his subsequent defeat at Newbury probably goes a little long way to suggest that. But I actually thought he ran quite well that day. It was a race that Le- Lethal Levi got loose off the front. And anything that was a good deal off the pace, including Ferris, just couldn't get into it. But you know, he, he ran pretty well to finish third. The time figure was extraordinarily good. The race has already worked out well. I think Mitro's on fire. Uh, it was run well out of it. And the, there was another one as well. Um, it ran the other day. What's it called now? Oh, Woolhampton at Windsor. Uh, so a couple of horses that were well down the field that day, Frank Laforme. And he's 25 to 1. So you're getting 25 to 1 for a horse that could have been easily in a, in a group race. Um, such um, is the regard that connections think, think of him. So... My two against the field. Um, the number one with that shadow of a doubt is Dark Trooper. I think he's a really good, talented horse. And Ferris is the other one. Ferris, 25 to 1, a short as 14s elsewhere. <clears throat> Dark Trooper, 12 to 1, uh, is standout. A bit of 10 to 1, general, the 9 to 1 in places. Uh, two more races to get through before we close our Royal Ascot previews for the year. Hand of God is the uh, 3 to 1 favourite in the Golden Gate Stakes with Old Faithful 9 to 1. Portsmouth 10 to 1, Rabat 10, 10 to 1, Approval 12 to 1, Persica 12 to 1, 14 to 1 bar those. Uh, Andy, we'll come to you first. Yeah, I want to take the favourite on here big time. Um, I, I don't think he's a 3 to 1 shot um, in anyone's money. Um, he's a nice horse, granted, and his Sandown win was okay, but it was just adequate. The time was just all right. He just didn't blow me away. I, I just don't get why he's a 3 to 1 shot. Um, I think there's three horses that. Um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say much better than him, but they're definitely what priced up miles bigger than what they should be based on the numbers they've been doing recently. Approval's one of them. Um, I thought he hit the line really strongly at Windsor, clocked a, a, a big time figure that day, beat all the right horses, very much going the right way. And the Haggis team have finally come out of that sort of early season slump that they were in. And I think they're going to peak for this meeting. Uh, Prima Lari was good on the figures when winning at York. And Jan Chapahayam is a... Trainer that Jamie mentioned as well, he's very much uh, one to keep on the right side of with their handicappers and they're very much in the overs category on the on the world pool. Uh, but the one here that is a colossal price that he's very much a, a, an under the radar one because it only won five days ago. And if it comes here, will be probably one of my strongest bets of the day. And that's Condor Passer. Currently 33 to one across the board. Um the the guys who uh, compile the time figures for for, for my service, um, I've just put this horse through and and I, I had to double check to see the numbers. Seriously, this, is that what this horse did? Uh, when winning a, a fairly what looked on paper a low going race at Carlisle, but it, it was astonishing. So it's clearly cl- capable of running a massive time figure, um, and is going to be very much underestimated here. Roger Verin had a great start to the meeting um, with Charin. So the yard's going really well. And I'd be interested if he does turn up here on Saturday. Uh, but I'll be prepared to roll the dice at 33 to 1 now in the preparation that he does come here. 33 to 1, a massive price um, there for uh, 
yeah, the Varian horse Condor Passer. Um, should just again point out if you do back Condor Passer for final decks and and he doesn't take up the engagement, then that will of course be a loser. But a 33 to 1, uh, obviously, it sounds like worth chancing. Uh, Jamie, what who do you fancy here? I mean, frankly, I've just been talked into basically everything that Andy <laughs> just put up. Uh, all three of those will be decent overs on Whirlpool, and I wouldn't put anyone off perming them up. And if you, geez, if you can get any of them in in the first three, the exact the swingers on those will pay big. Um, the one I'm going to throw in there, another one that that may well pay overs would be another Roger Verin horse in the form of So Juice. Um, I won't spend too long on this because I've spoken about these sort of form lines before with Al McCam and English Harbour, um, which will get tested. You know, Al McCam, I thought, ran with credit in the St. James's Palace, um, albeit not spectacularly, but still he was, you know, he was sixth, beaten, I think, four lengths in the end and, and you know, beat, beat home the Guineas, the, the, the Guineas winners. So, um, albeit a Guineas winner that probably ran below par. So, you know, the form has a really strong look to it. If Indelible goes in the Sandringham, the form will have an even stronger look to it um, through various contingent form lines and so juice off 88 could be absolutely thrown in here um he's eloped vega colt who won his maiden last time at leicester the form is not really worth much but he did it in such easy style that you don't really know what what is left under the hood and uh he could make a mockery of a mark of 88 so so that's so juice for me but but really i'm going to be rowing in with andy if i'm honest <laughs> <laughs> uh so juice is um one price one yeah uh so many here yeah so used to 14 to one best price that stands uh right now um finally we've got the queen alexandra states uh to take us home dawn rising the four to one favorite queenstown nine to two run for oscar seven to one voban eight to one uxmal uh eight to one nine to one about postileo postileo uh Bellocchio, uh ten to one trushan ten to one sumo sam ten to one uh jamie who do you fancy in the in the lucky last for the week to be honest, I don't have a strong view on it yet. Um, Dawn Rising makes a load of sense having won the race last year. And if there was to be a bit of dig in the ground from somewhere, then Tash can. It comes out very well at the weights, but I'm not sure he wants it rattling um, and would be big overs for Brian Ellison and Ben and Ben Robinson. Um, with that in mind, I also I'd, lo- I'd like Bellocchio. If Bellocchio came here, um, backing up after, mm. his, after his win on Tuesday. Um, you know, they don't tend to run them unless they're, they're happy and bouncing in themselves so I, I don't really worry too much about, about the five-day turnaround um and you know he's around 10 to 1 at the moment i, I suspect would shorten if it looked like he he was going to run uh, he's dropped up so we'll, we'll see what we'll watch that space um so really it's a bit of a watching brief for me and a bit ground dependent and i, I guess probably a small vote for dawn rising but he'll be unders in whirlpool um so i'm probably waiting until nearer the time to have a stronger view um, but yeah, let's go. Let's go, Bellocchio. I hope he turns up here and does the double. I'd love that. It would be the double for you as well. Yeah, ten to one for Bellocchio in the last to back up that win on day one. Andy. Yeah, I'd be very much in the, in the same camp as Jamie. I, I like backing horses at these festivals that are trying to repeat, particularly like Galway Festival. We've had some horses that have actually won three times there in the past. Everyone thinks it's a negative, but I actually take it as a positive. I, I just think they're superior fitness wise and, and particularly um track uh, knowledge wise the fact that Bellocchio has won here for the first time of asking the first time he set foot at the box the track has got to stand him in good stead i mm. thought he was a comfortable winner um of that mile six race he'll definitely get the trip he, lo- he looks as though he's, he's all about stamina um and he's got a bit of class about him so that i mean that 10 to 1 is very very tempting but you just you just don't know do you do, do you take four five to one on the day and kind of just accept that 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 you know, is 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 a lot more of a sensible option than running the risk of him not running. Um, I'm not sure whether connections are going to run Vauban. But the word on the street is that he might not might not go. Um, and you've got to pay respect to last year's winner, Dawn Rising. But he was well beaten by um, the O'Brien filly, um, Queenstown, behind Kiprios last time out in the Group Three. That was a very 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 big time figure that um, Savile Beg this season. And um, Queenstown definitely improved, has improved since the headgear's gone on her. So I think she's a she's a uh, you know, a bona fide Group Two stroke Group Three horse in in what ostensibly is often a, a race that is full of um, national horses and handicappers. 
And I do think that the, the, the two standout horses from that category that look like running are Queenstown and, um, and Bellocchio. Queenstown, yeah, Bellocchio we've already covered. Um, and we've got Queenstown. Is so I'm going to open yeah, nine to two. Uh, nine yeah. to two best prices, short of seven to two in places. Um, so that brings our Royal Ascot week and our previews to a close. Thank you very much to our partners over the course of this series, uh, the Tote for uh, sponsoring the show and to Jamie for joining us for the five days. Make sure you do check out all of the offers. England playing tomorrow. If you have a five pound bet on the England game, you will get a one pound free play spot for every goal that is scored. So that'll be seven eight pounds play spots after we beat uh, Denmark tomorrow uh, and of course you can check out the beat Benson and other offers up there as well loads of stuff going on at the tote so make sure you check it out and of course download the odds checker app where you can get the best prices book your offers free bets place terms and Andy's tips straight to the app every single uh, day of racing but also the, the, the night before when it comes to big festivals like Ascot so we've got you covered thank you Andy thank you Jamie pleasure cheers George great fun thanks Andy have a great week And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the racing uh, and please do ensure that you're gambling responsibly.